And Neil, you are both an active neuroscientist, um, a philosopher of mind in looking at the meaning of this, and also one of the major participants in the entire structure of consciousness studies today. And I'd like to focus on the latter. As you look at the field uh, today, um, what is its shape? Uh, what does it look like? What are the different characterizations, uh, the, the, the different um, uh, sub, uh, sub-modalities in the field that, that consist of consciousness studies in total? I mean, very kind of you to put it that way. I, I think when I look at the state of the field right now, three things come to mind. It's productive, it's exciting, and it's also a little bit precarious. So the, the excitement aspect of it comes, it's tied up with the productive aspect. So right now, uh, we've moved from a stage of just looking for, let's say, neural correlates of consciousness, things that go along with consciousness in, in the brain, towards a perspective more informed by theory. How far can we really explain things? There are an, there's now a proliferation of, of theories. You will notice you wrote a, a wonderful <laughs> review of the, the vast number of theories. I think you'd probably agree, maybe too many theories <laughs> as we have them now. That's part of the precarity of it. So right now we have a few leading theories. Uh, they're all very interesting. They're all motivating different kinds of experiments. So there's productive cycles of theory development and experimentation happening. And there's experiments now and projects going on to compare and contrast these theories to try and disambiguate between them. These are challenging, but they're helping give the field, I think, they're helping define this shape so that the field can figure out mm. what kind of shape it actually has. Mm. Part of the precarity there is that a lot of the theories that we have turn out to be theories of different things. Um, so it's not, for instance, a direct parallel that we might have had with physics 100, 150 years ago where we had contrasting explanations for things like light or, or gravity that could be pitted against each other in experiments. That's, that's not happening yet. Um, what I think is needed is the, to give the theories that exist, my, my own included, more precision about what their assumptions are, about the predictions they make, um, and about their remit, their domain of application. And by doing this, you know, we'll be able to see Firstly, where the holes are, what is not accounted for mm -hmm. by some of the theories that is accounted for by others, and we'll be able to see better how we can begin to tease apart the different theories, or maybe come up with new ones that take the working bits of some mm -hmm. theories and, and lose some other bits, because I think we're only at the beginning of theoretical neuroscience about consciousness. One of the challenges that I see in looking at the uh, development of uh, of theories as it relates to um, uh, uh, predictions in, in terms of adversarial collaborations and things like that, is that the, the predictions are, are, are specific parts of the theory, but they don't address the fundamental aspects of the theory. Um, and that almost no matter what the result would be of, of that prediction, I wouldn't have a lot of confidence that it, it, it has a significant impact on the totality of the theory. So I think the challenge is making, making predictions, if possible, that really address the core of the theory. I only partly agree with you. <laughs> I think there's this um, temptation to want a very Popperian resolution to these kinds of theoretical comparisons. There'll be a single experiment which will refute a given theory by falsifying one of its core tenets. But this doesn't happen that often. I think consciousness research is not there. It'd be nice if it is, but it's not necessarily problematic if it isn't. There's another philosophical framework, philosophy of science now rather than philosophy of minds, from Imre Lakatos. Uh, and he recognized that quite often you've got this hard core of any theory, and those elements of the theory may not be testable in and of themselves. Right, with, right. The, with the tools that we have right, now. Right. But what really matters is whether the, there's a kind of periphery to that theory where testable predictions can be motivated by that theory. The question is, are those predictions themselves testable? Do they give explanatory grip and insight about you know, aspects of consciousness? And if they do, well, that theory is productive. You know, it will help us explain, even if right now the core 
remains hard to test itself. Okay. Of course, if that's not the case, and these peripheral uh, predictions, the predictions that lie outside the hardcore, if they are falsified or if they are just boring, if they're redundant, they don't <laughs> tell us anything, then we have what Lakatosh would call a degenerative research program. So the question for me is which of the theories will give rise to productive research programs and which will give rise to degenerative research programs.